1907 was a historic year in the history of Austrian democracy. For the very first time, all citizens above the age of 24, except for women, were able to vote for their representatives in the Reichsrat, or the Imperial Council in free, equal and direct elections. As a result, the Imperial Council grew to 516 seats, and therefore became the largest parliament in Europe at the time. This Imperial Council was a place where representatives from all Austrian crownlands with vastly different mother tongues met to discuss imperial policies. However, in the seven years that it operated, the parliament building became somewhat of a tourist attraction, but probably not in the sense it was intended. Many people from Vienna frequently visited the Imperial Council to get a laugh out of the completely chaotic discussions that occurred. In this video, we will discover how and why the right to vote was granted to everybody in 1907, and how the parliament functioned. We will then discuss why the Imperial Council became such a chaotic mess, and try to use it as a case study of how not to organise a parliament. Our story begins in 1859. The Austrian army had just suffered a terrible defeat near the small town of Solferino against a Franco-Sardinian alliance. As a result, Austria had to give up Lombardy, its most valuable land, and Habsburg ruled Tuscany, Modena and Emilia were annexed by Sardinia. For Austria, this was a financial and a military catastrophe, which deeply struck the absolutist system at its core. Even though he was absolutely not at fault for any of this, the interior minister Alexander von Bach got replaced by Agenor Gorbuchowski, the governor of Galicia. Kaiser Franz Josef also proceeded to significantly expand the Reichsrat, an advisory body which had been established eight years earlier and was made up of six Austrian and two Hungarian officials. Ten of those new members were either archdukes or clerical dignitaries and were supposed to represent the landowning class. Additionally, and that was a novelty, 38 representatives from the Austrian Kremlins also joined this Reichsrat, including two Croats and two Serbs. The council was headed by the liberal archduke Rainer von Österreich and was tasked with advising the Kaiser on financial and sometimes constitutional matters. So it had no legal power, but it was certainly the first step away from the old absolutist system. But make no mistake, this step was not taken out of pure kindness. After the war, Austria's financial situation was a disaster, and the state urgently needed money. The financial minister Karl Ludwig von Bruck realised that in exchange for loans from the nobility, the Kaiser needed to grant them at least some form of representation which they had been demanding ever more since 1848. The Kaiser was deeply concerned about this being the beginning of a new constitutional system. He told his government to carefully avoid anything that could fuel the constitutional cravings that have been appearing more frequently for some time. Another demand that many Austrian aristocrats often voiced was the establishment of a federalist system in which the different crown lands would become more autonomous and thus be responsible for their regional politics. So in 1860, under the blessing of the Kaiser, Agenor Gorbuchowski issued the October Diplo. It was a new constitution that re-established the regional parliaments. Every parliament would then elect representatives to the big imperial council in Vienna, where they would debate over the national budget. With that new constitution, power was taken away from Vienna and instead distributed to the individual crownlands. Of course, these representatives came from the upper classes and were mostly aristocratic landowners, bishops and wealthy traders. A lot of people were unhappy with the October Diploma. Hungarian politicians complained that it reduced Hungary to simply one part of the empire and didn't grant it more autonomy. Many liberals were also disappointed. They argued that the constitution didn't go far enough and that it was still a step back compared to the parliamentary system that had shortly existed in 1848. The liberal newspapers were shredding the new constitution apart. Franz Josef, still trying to gain favours from the credit lenders, gave in. He fired Gorbuchowski and replaced him with a certain Anton Ritter von Schmerling. In 1848 Schmerling had been a revolutionary and a member of the Frankfurt Parliament and was therefore well liked by the Austrian liberals. The conservatives also respected him for his moderate stance. He was also considered to be a skilled government official and enjoyed an excellent reputation. Together with a number of civil servants he created the new February constitution in 1861. It granted the Imperial Council not only the right to discuss the imperial budget, but also to have an active say in domestic politics. Still, it was a deeply unjust system. 
The parliament was based on a dual chamber system. In the upper house, the Herrenhals, the members were directly appointed by the crown for life and were usually aristocrats, clergymen and so-called dignitaries. The roughly 300 members of the lower house, the Abgartenhals, were members of the various regional parliaments elected by the Curia voting system. This meant that all people entitled to the vote were separated into four different Curias. The landowners, the chambers of commerce and industry, men who were liable for a very high tax rate in cities and in the countryside. As you can see, only people with a high degree of wealth were entitled to vote. On top of that, the voting districts were designed in a way that directly benefited the Germans and the landowners. For a law to be passed, both the lower and the upper house, as well as the Kaiser, had to agree to it. But despite all of its flaws, the February constitution paved the way for a constitutional Austrian monarchy. Now that we know how the empire-wide parliament came into being, I will just very quickly outline the most important changes to parliament and the voting system until the beginning of the 20th century. After the Austro-Hungarian Compromise of 1867, Hungary was no longer represented in the Imperial Council. The official name of Austria from that point on was the kingdoms and countries represented in the Imperial Council. From 1873 onward, all representatives were directly elected to the Imperial Council, instead of the previous system where they had to be members of a regional parliament first. Curiously, women were, for the very first time, explicitly denied the right to vote. Before the reform, a woman could technically vote if she had a certain amount of wealth, which was very rarely the case. In 1882, the amount of taxes you had to pay before acquiring the right to vote was universally lowered to 5 gulden. Before that, the amount had been different across the cities. Finally, in 1896, a fifth Curia was introduced that included all men above the age of 24 that had lived in the same place for more than a year. Still, the voting system was incredibly unfair. The around 5 million new eligible voters could only vote on 72 out of 425 total representatives. Now that all male citizens finally had at least some form of representation, the Social Democratic Workers' Party hoped that this would give them an edge over all the other parties. The result was a bit disappointing, however. Out of the 72 possible seats, the Social Democrats only gained 14 in the elections of 1897. To increase their chances, many socialists demanded the equal right to vote for everyone, and Viktor Adler, the founder and leader of the SDAP, declared it to be the party of voting rights. One reason for the disappointing result was the emergence of other parties that were simultaneously vying for votes from the lower classes. Those were mainly the Christian Social Party and the German National Party. Both were very skilled in exploiting preconceptions and fears about socialism and its internationalistic policies. The Christian Social Party especially also used anti-Semitism for its political gains in a very successful way, especially in the capital of Vienna. For the time being, the Social Democrats had to accept defeat. Nevertheless, their demand for the equal right to vote didn't cease and they continued to organize and to gain followers, especially in the highly industrialized regions of Bohemia, Moravia, Styria and Lower Austria. The time for social upheaval seemed ripe in 1905. In October, the news of the Russian Tsar granting certain civil liberties and the establishment of the state Duma reached the Habsburg monarchy. Upon hearing this, thousands of Viennese workers and Social Democratic Party members took to the streets in order to celebrate and to make their demands heard. Unfortunately for them, the police responded with violence. On the Ringstraße, mounted police officers charged the demonstrators with their sabers. Dozens of people were wounded or got trampled on by the horses. For the 5th of November, the Social Democrats organized a massive demonstration. The front page of the Arbeiter Zeitung, the party newspaper, read, Party comrades, workers of Vienna, the fight for our rights continues despite everything and will not stop until victory is ours. We will meet on Sunday morning from half past 11 to half past 12 on the Ringstraße between Bellaria and the University, away with the Curia Parliament, out with universal, equal and direct suffrage, forward in spite of everything. Unlike three days earlier, the police decided not to intervene. Vienna, however, was not the only city that fought for the right to vote. The Arbeiterzeitung writes of similar demonstrations in St. Pölten, Graz, Salzburg, Klagenfurt, Brünn, Mirisch-Ostrau, Jägerndorf, Teschen, Reichenberg, 
Teplitz, Pilsen, Platno, Lemberg, Tarnopol and Prague. In Prague, violent clashes occurred between the protesters and the police, where hundreds were wounded and one even got killed. As you can see, the desire for the equal right to vote was present in people all over the Austrian Empire. The Empire could no longer ignore those demands and was no longer willing to respond with violence. Ironically enough, they even endorsed them, and not because they loved democracy so much. The Austrian government hoped that new elections would empower parties that could resolve the ever-growing conflict between the nationalities, which would finally result in a functioning parliament. They also saw it as a threatening gesture towards Hungary, where the restrictive right to vote had brought upper-class parties into power that now wanted to separate from Austria. In 1906, Max Vladimir Freiherr von Beck became the new minister-president. In December of that year, he managed to pass the constitutional reform through the parliament, and one month later, the Kaiser gave it his blessing. The Social Democrats were ecstatic and optimistic about their future, and they had every right to be. After all, it was their reform, and they alone managed to get rid of the old feudal Kyoria system, which had so unfairly benefited the upper classes, and for the first time ever, everyone's voice was considered equal. Except for women's, but that's a story for a different time. Let us listen to a speech that Viktor Adler gave in December 1906. <laughs> Hier wird auch zunächst die berufliche Zufall. Wenn Sie aber nun eine neue Waffe in Ihrem Werken anpassen, werden wir durch den neuen Kampfbedingungen auch neue Schützen und schwere, schwere Aufgaben aufnehmen. Sie wird Ihre Aufgaben aber nur lösen können, wenn Sie sie auch in der Zukunft and then in May of 1907, the first equal election happened with a staggering voter participation of 80%. This reform completely changed the political landscape. Now that everyone could vote, parties that represented the lower classes gained massive traction. The Social Democrats increased their seats from 10 to 86, and the Christian Socials grew from 25 to 96 seats. No party gained an outright majority, however, and coalitions changed very often. The hope that the reform would somehow solve the national conflict was delusional, for lack of a better word. All national conflicts were reflected in the Reichsrat. The Germans were by no means united in anything. The non-German parties held together against the Germans, but they were also constantly fighting among each other. The Ruthenians, for example, got into heated arguments on whether they should support the Russian or the Austrian Empire. The only faction that remained decently stable were the Poles. They realized that compared to the fate of the other Poles in Russia and Germany, they had no real right to complain and therefore cooperated with the Austrian institutions. There were two main reasons for why the Reichsrat became such a place of anarchy. Firstly, there was no single language used in the parliament as Austria did not have a national language. As such, every representative could speak one of ten languages. German, Czech, Polish, Ruthenian, Serbian, Croatian, Slovenian, Italian, Romanian and Russian. And because there were no translators on the scene, most people in the parliament had no idea what the others were saying. There were motions to introduce German as the sole language, but that motion was blocked by the non-German majority. The second problem was that there was no speaking time limitation, so every parliamentarian could speak for as long as he wanted. And again, there were no translators, so most people couldn't actually tell if the person speaking was actually holding a speech, or simply trying to block the parliament by repeating nonsensical phrases or whatever came into his mind. The absolutely worst offenders were the members of the anti-German, anti-Semitic and anti-parliamentarian Czech National Social Party. 
In protest to martial law that had been proclaimed in Prague in December 1908, the Czech parliamentarians marched into the Reichsrat with drums, trumpets and caused a racket. The parliament could do nothing about this. They repeated the strategy numerous times. After a dispute broke out over a possible change of the language laws in Bohemia in 1909 that would have benefited the German minority, the moderate Czech politician Tomasz Masaryk attempted to argue for cooperation. However, he could not utter a single word, as the Czech national socials constantly disrupted him with whatever noisy instruments they could find. This circus continued for a few more days until the parliament was temporarily suspended. The discussions did not get any more civilized after it was reopened a few months later. One Ruthenian politician obstructed the parliament for 13 hours over the matter of a Ukrainian university in Lemberg. One radical Czech held a six-hour speech in which he calmly ate his ham sandwich and drank his cognac while reading off a newspaper. Disappointed, Kaiser Franz Josef tells the Hungarian Prime Minister, if the members of parliament know nothing better to do than to keep arguing about national disputes, they should at least stay away from me. Now to the big question, why did so many parliamentarians act like this? Why did they feel the need to actively hinder the proceedings? Why didn't they discuss their grievances like any normal MEP should? Because that's how they got what they wanted. Here's an example from 1897. The minister-president Kazimir Badini attempted to curry favour with the Czech representatives by introducing a language reform in Bohemia and Moravia, which would have forced local civil servants to provide their services in both German and Czech, even in the majority German areas. This infuriated the German nationalists in the Reichsrat, who began to start fights and to throw around obscenities. The official protocol records phrases such as Cognac brother, drunken buffoon, brothel father. One parliamentarian said to his opponent that his grandmother was conceived on a manual heap. When Badini was unable to keep the situation under control and when the fight threatened to escalate onto the streets, he resigned. Though in the minority, the German nationalists had enforced their demands, the language reform was slowly taken back. And so inevitably, many have learned from this example and attempted to replicate that success. Many people in Vienna made frequent visits to the Reichsrat to observe the never-ending chaos and arguments. Even the young Adolf Hitler often went there. Now, whenever time offered me the opportunity, I would go there again and again and quietly and attentively look at the respective picture, listen to the speeches as far as I could understand them, study the more or less intelligent faces of these chosen ones of the nations of this sad state. The excesses continued more or less severely until March of 1914, when the government used an emergency clause to temporarily send the parliamentarians home. It was only briefly reopened in 1917, and then never again. Sadly, the Reichstag didn't solve the nationality conflict that brewed in the Austrian monarchy in the 20th century. The big problem was that the Curia voting system remained in the regional parliament, which kept the bourgeois nationalists in power. In Lemberg, Poles argued with the Ruthenians. In Marburg, Zilli and Laibach, the tensions between Germans and Slovenes increased. In Trieste, Italians protested against Slovenian migrants. In Bohemia and Moravia, the issue over bilingual administrations remained unsolved. None of these problems could have been solved with one single universal solution. Every conflict needed to be carefully approached on its own and oftentimes a compromise was needed. But the willingness for that just wasn't there. The parliament also had too many flaws to make it able to work on such a delicate and complicated matter as it could be put out of work way too easily and therefore encouraged obstructionism by a ruthless few. However, it was nothing that couldn't be fixed. It's just that Austria never had the time to do that as it got dissolved in 1918. The fight for the right to vote shows how dedicated the citizens of Austria were to have a say in how the empire was run and how they identified with it. With the introduction of the right to vote, the local power of the aristocrats slowly dwindled and gave way to mass movement parties such as the Social Democrats and the Christian Socials. These mass parties appealed not to certain ethnicities, but to workers and Catholics respectively. They attempted to bridge the gap between Austria's various nationalities and managed to gain support all over the empire. Both of these parties, as different as they may have been, questioned the current relations of power and aspired for a renewed Austrian empire. As such, I wouldn't call the parliament a failed experiment, but rather the beginning of a positive development that, unfortunately, never had the chance to show its results.
Alright then, thank you for watching and hopefully you've enjoyed today's episode. If you did, a like and a subscribe would be well appreciated. A special and huge thank you goes out to my kind supporters on Ko-Fi, namely A Cup of Tea, Tristan Kriegsmann, Ryan Leighton and Filip Marchewka. You are absolute legends. Anyway, have a very nice rest of the day and goodbye.